In this video, I'm going to be walking you through the derivation of the inverse kinematics equations for position for a cylindrical manipulator. I've shown you the kinematic diagram for the cylindrical manipulator here, and the process for deriving the position inverse kinematics equations is going to be the same as we saw in the last video with the Cartesian manipulator. We're going to first look at the manipulator from the side view and write as many equations as we can from that view, and then we'll look at it from the top view and see if we can fill in the missing equations. So to start with, we're going to imagine that our I is over here, and we'll be looking at the manipulator like this. In other words, we're standing from outside the screen and we're looking straight into this screen at this manipulator. So let's try and draw this manipulator as it would look from the side view. We'll start at the bottom and draw this, uh, this revolute joint, joint number one, first. I'm going to draw it just like a rectangle because since we're not looking at it, since we're not looking at it in perspective, this cylinder will look more like a rectangle. I'll then draw in the axes that I can see from the side view. We'll have x0 pointing out to the right, and we'll have z0 pointing straight up. Next, we have joint one over here, which I'll try and draw more like a square than a rectangle, and it's connected with a link. And then I'll draw in the axes that I can see, which will be x1 to the right, and z1 up to the top. And then, finally, we'll have joint number three up here, also connected by a link and its axes will be z2 to the right and y2 to the top. If you have difficulty picturing in your head what this manipulator will look like from a different view, you can start out by simply eliminating all of the axes that go either into or out of the page. Those are the ones that will be invisible when you do the side view. And similarly, from the top view, all of the axes that either go straight up or straight down are the ones that will be invisible. So thinking about it that way might help you uh, figure out what this thing will look like from the side or top views. Lastly, I have to draw in the link that goes to my end effector along with the end effector axes. So since I'm looking at it from the side, the invisible axes are the ones that go into and out of the page, so x3 will be invisible. That will leave me with z3 and y3. Now the last thing I have to do before I try and start writing equations is to draw in the variables and link lengths that are visible from my side view. Here I have a link length of A1 that defines the distance between the origin of frame 0 and the origin of frame 1. Theta1 here is invisible to me down here in joint 0. However, theta1 will affect the distance up here that it looks like is the distance between frame 2 and frame 3. So I'm going to have to be very careful when I write out the length of this link that I remember that theta1 could be rotated. But down here in the first joint I I can't see theta1 at all. Next I'll write out the distance between uh, the origin of the one frame and the origin of the two frame. This distance will be equal to my link length, A2, plus however much displacement has been uh, 
achieved from this um, joint number one. So this will be A2 plus D2. Now finally, as I mentioned a moment before, the distance between frame two and frame three is not really just A3 plus D3 because that distance depends upon what angle A1 is turned to, or rather what angle theta1 is turned to. So for now, I'm going to leave that one blank and we'll deal with that one from the top view. Here in the side view I can write only one equation because I have only one variable d2 to use. So this equation is going to come from me looking at the distance here, the distance in z0. So I'll write this equation the z position of frame 3 in frame 0 will be equal to this entire distance which is a1 plus a2 plus d2. Now I'm going to change the order of this equation around a little bit because remember I want this to be an equation for d2. So D2 is going to be equal to the Z position of frame 3 minus A1 minus A2. So there I've managed to get one equation from the side view. Next I'm going to take a look at this manipulator from the top view. So from the top view I'm going to imagine that my eye is up here and we're going to look down from the top. That will make any axes that are vertical, either straight up or straight down, be invisible to me. So I'm going to try and draw this manipulator from the top view. Also, because I need to use the angle theta1 in my top view, since I haven't used it in my side view, I'm going to assume that theta1 is not 0. Assuming that theta1 is not 0 will allow me to see it a little bit better. So I'm going to start by drawing this uh, stack of joints as it would be seen from the top view. So the bottom joint, the revolute joint, will look just like a circle. Now I won't actually be able to see that circle because the other two joints will be blocking it, but I will be able to see its axes. So I'm going to draw in the axes that I'll be able to see. I'll be able to see x0 and I'll be able to see y0. Next I'm going to draw joint number 2 and I'm going to draw joint number two as it would look if theta one was non-zero. So if theta one was not zero, joint number two, I would see it positioned at an angle, kind of like this. And its joints would look like this. I'd see x1 in that direction and I would see y1 perpendicular to x1. Notice that I didn't draw anything for this link that connects the uh, joint 0 to joint 1. The reason why I didn't do that is because this link is invisible to me looking down from the top. Next I'm going to draw the third joint. The third joint will appear to be exactly on top of the second joint. So there isn't anything else to draw there. And uh, however I can draw its axes and its axes will be lined up precisely with the axes of frame 1. Except notice that they're called different things because of our conventions. So this will be Z2 lined up with X1 and then we'll have x2 in the same direction as y1 as you see in the kinematic diagram here. 
Lastly, I'm going to draw the link that leads to the end effector. That link goes in the direction of Z2. So I'll draw that link here going off in the direction of Z2 with the end effector at the end of it. And I can also draw the axes that are visible on the end effector. They will be Z3 in the direction of the link and I'll also be able to see X3 perpendicular to it. So the next step in this is to draw in my variables. Now there are only a couple of variables that are visible to me from the top view. One of them is theta1. You can kind of see now why I drew this picture with theta1 not equal to 0. If I had drawn it with theta1 equal to 0, even though theta1 is visible to me from the top view, I would have difficulty drawing it into my picture. And so with a, not having it drawn into my picture, it would make it difficult for me to write equations using it. So there's theta1. And the other variables that I can see are these two variables up here. The distance between uh, the center of all of these origins and the end effector is going to be equal to A3 plus D3. Okay, so now I need to get two equations from this picture. I know that I need to have two equations because I only got one equation from the side view and I have two variables here that I didn't use at all in the other equations. So I want to come up with two equations here that have theta1 and d3 in them. I'm going to do that by uh, noticing a triangle let me draw this in green so you can see the triangle. I'm going to identify this triangle right here and use that triangle to write my equations. The first equation I'm going to write is using the Pythagorean theorem. I'm going to notice that the distance here is x the x position of frame 3 relative to frame 0. And this distance right here is the y position of 3 relative to frame 0. Notice that the y0 axis is right over here perpendicular to the x0 axis. So that's kind of nice and, and handy for me that I have those two lengths. I also have the length of the hypotenuse, which is over here, a3 plus d3. So I can write an equation using the Pythagorean theorem, and it'll go like this. I have x3, 0 squared plus y3, 0 squared is equal to the length of the hypotenuse, a3 plus d3 squared. Now I still need to rearrange this equation because I want it to say d3 equals something. So I'm going to do a little bit of algebraic manipulation here. I'm going to start by taking the square root of both sides so that I get the square root of x03 squared plus y03 squared is equal to a3 plus d3. And then I can simply subtract a3 from both sides and come up with this equation, that d3 is equal to the square root of x03 squared plus y03 squared minus a3. And that gives me equation number two. I still have to write one more equation. And this equation is going to have to use theta1 since I haven't used the theta1 variable yet. In order to use theta1 in an equation, 
I could use any sinusoidal function that I want to use, but I'm going to choose to use tangent. So I'm going to write that the tangent of theta 1 is equal to the opposite length, which is y, divided by the adjacent length, which is x. So here I have that the tangent of theta 1 is equal to y0,3 divided by x0,3. And now I want to go ahead and get that um, theta by itself. So I'm going to use the arc tangent and say that theta 1 is equal to a tan, which will be not a times the tangent, but it's the arc tangent of y0,3 divided by x0,3. And that gives me equation number 3. And so here I have the derivation of the three equations that relate the joint variables to the end effector location for the cylindrical manipulator.